Good evening and welcome to our discussion. Um, Dr. Mensa, thank you all for coming. I drew this pie here for a reason that these numbers I'll explain momentarily. Tonight's discussion really tends to focus on the idea of depression. And I want to share with you that when I say idea, that's what I truly mean, because depression is a term, believe it or not. It's not really a condition. Now, you guys are saying, wait a minute now. My entire life is built around this thing in my education. I've got a PhD and this D and that D and all these wonderful Ds behind my name. And I'm told depression is a condition. Depression is a description of a group of symptoms that people are turning depression. Okay. Those symptoms are even quite spread out. Melancholia, dysthymia, bipolar disorder, uh, even some forms of anxiety have actually been labeled depression. Many schizophrenics have been labeled depressed. Many bipolar individuals, I think I said them already, um, individuals in many, with many of these disorders have actually been labeled as depressive. Now, starting there, I just want to go back to a, a few interesting little roots. Forget this pie, but within this pie, I'm going to write the term de primere, which is the Latin etymology for depression. It means to depress, okay, to push down. And we see that this term, well, of course, if it's Latin, that means that there had to be something going on back in the days of Rome that people had acknowledged as being a challenge or a condition. Okay? But we find in ancient writings back to the 700s, literally, in Indian culture, um, terms and discussions about depression. So this is nothing new. Mankind has known about these types of conditions for a very, very long time. But our understanding and our treatment and our approach to treatment has sort of evolved. We've gone from, well, at one point in time, drilling holes in people's heads to relieve the pressure, to relieve the spirits that were absolutely affecting individuals and suppressing them or depressing them, to talk therapy, to discussions, to pharmaceuticals, to drugs, and now to chemistry. Okay. And most people who've seen us or have been with us or followed our videos know that we're going to talk about a biochemical basis for these things. But the real key that I want to talk about is that in our approach, even in my discussions, we spent a lot of time really talking about more so the term than really sort of the, the breakdown. Here, what we're going to recognize in our discussion are called biotypes. And what is a biotype? Well, we're looking and we're seeing that different individuals have different chemistries that tend to lead to different symptoms or similar symptoms that we have packaged into lovely terms and, and different terminologies, some overlapping, some not. But what we've come to see is that there's certain biochemical forms, or formulations, if you will, that are inherent either in our genetic code or in our environment that trigger many of our responses that lead to what we call depression. I'm going to write this up here just so we don't forget. Depression. My partner, Dr. Bowman, will always tell you my handwriting is not the prettiest. Now then, when we talk about biotypes, we're talking about chemistries, and many of you recognize we talk about different chemistries such as under-methylation and over-methylation, such as copper disorder, such as uh, pyroluric dysfunction. Well, what we've seen now, what we've come to understand through the brilliant work of Dr. William Welsh and uh, earlier Dr. Carl Pfeiffer, is that roughly about 40% of individuals who fall into this category that we would describe as depression are actually under-methylated. Another 20% tend to be over-methylated. I'll write methyl here. Another 20% tend to be actually pyroluric. Another 
tend to be high in copper. Five percent here tend to be toxic metals. Another five percent tend to fall in the category of other. Now, well, Dr. Mensa, where do these numbers come from? Uh, I mean, I put all this stuff here in this lovely pie chart that you decorated so well, and this just doesn't mean a whole lot to me uh, without some background to history. Well, I'm glad you folks asked that question, because really what we're looking at here is the summary synthesis of over 20 years' worth of research and work, work done by Dr. William Walsh and Dr. Carl Pfeiffer. Over 300,000 biochemical assays over 20 years to produce this information and 2,800 patients. Of that group, what we see here is this breakdown, that when we analyze the overall chemistry of all these individuals who claim to have depression, and when I say claim, I use that term very loosely, they weren't feeling good, okay? But after all these analyses, we saw that roughly 40% of them had very low levels of methyl. Another 20% had tremendously high levels of methyl. 20% of those individuals here actually had pyroluria. And we'll talk about each one of these. Another 50% were high in copper. So copper dismetabolism was actually the term being used. 5% had toxic metals that were present. Things like cadmium, arsenic, lead. And other areas, another 5% can be dietary, such as gluten sensitivities or food or gut difficulties or challenges. So, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Now we have a name to go along with the percentages, to go along with the numbers. But what do these things really mean? Oh, what do you know? <laughs> I even forgot that I put this up here about three conversations ago. Let's start with what a methyl is, because somebody out there is asking, so what's a methyl? Okay. Well, a methyl is a carbon with either three or four hydrogen molecules associated, hydrogen atoms, excuse me. And, well, what's the real significance of that? Methyl is what I call a key, like your car key. You put your car key in the car and you turn it, and it turns on. And then when you turn it in the other direction, it turns off. Well, thank you for the kindergarten lesson, Dr. Mensa. I get it. Well, methyl is the same way, except far more complicated. In your body, in your system, methyl is both an activator as well as an inactivator of a veritable cascade of biochemical reactions. Not to mention, methyl also has significant effects on DNA and not just DNA, genetic expression of DNA. And not just genetic expression of DNA, the transport molecules that affect the genes, that affect the DNA, that allow for expression, that allow for you becoming who you are. So what are we really talking about? We're talking about peeling the outer epidermis of the human person. We're talking about getting beyond the organs and clearing that stuff out. We're talking about looking beyond the nerves and the nervous system and neurotransmitters now we're taking a terrifically powerful microscope and looking into your genetic code. The real key here is breaking you down into who you are genetically and biochemically. Okay. Methyl, we found out, is really one of several key processes. And by methyl, I really mean methylation, because it is a process by which elements are methylated, demethylated, or sit in competition with other processes like acetylation or phosphorylation. Now, all the chemists out there are going, yeah, 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 we know, get to the point. Okay. Well, we have this competition, but methyl is a very important creature in this particular equation. So, once again, methyl serves as a key to either activate or inactivate enzymes, hormones, neurotransmitters, and it also has genetic function. Now, we can either have too much methyl, excuse me, and be overly methylated, or we can have too little methyl and be what we call under methylated. Very simple terms, but with huge ramifications. Okay? 
Now, all the scientists out there, all the doctors and the LBDs out there want to know, but what about the neurotransmitters themselves? How does it, what, what does all this have to do with anything? Well, when we look at undermethylators, and I want you to remember this, undermethylators tend to be very low in serotonin activity. That's point number one I want you to remember. Undermethylators tend to be low in serotonin. But that's not all they're low in. They tend to be low in dopamine. Okay? Put that in your little mental basket here for a minute. Overmethylators, on the other hand, diametrically opposed, tend to be high in serotonin, and they tend to be high in dopamine activity. I bring these things up because these are going to be extremely fundamental with regard to why and how we treat these particular entities using a nutraceutical model. Okay? Let's just take let's just take drugs for a minute here. Okay? For the term depression, we're very well accustomed to individuals, doctors, whomever, prescribing drugs. One of the most common drugs we'll find being used for depression, just anybody. Yes, don't overwhelm me. Okay. Prozac, Prozac, okay. Mobutrin, Zoloft, the SSRIs, part of the latest and greatest team of drugs that we use to treat this condition that just turns lives around. Let's break that down for a minute here. Hope we've got a clear page. Oh, that's the next one. We'll wait. With SSRIs, they're basically stopping serotonin from being destroyed. And when you don't destroy serotonin, you've got much more serotonin left to do its work for neural communication. So it sits there in the space where between two nerves so that they can communicate pretty well. The idea or the theory behind depression was that why, by golly, people must be low in serotonin. Because serotonin is your feel-good, make-you-happy-and-content neurotransmitter. And by the way, so is dopamine. So when we first started working with this, and we being the scientific community and all of our brilliance and grandeur, we determined that it must be a low serotonin problem. So we developed drugs that would stop serotonin from being destroyed, and therefore would make people happy and content. So, when we did that, we actually found that a whole lot of people did well. And somebody said, Eureka, we have got it. So now what are we going to do? We're going to form clones of these drugs and put different names on them and different things so we can sell a great product. And we're making billions of dollars and people are all getting better. Well, not exactly. Many people did pretty well. Now for them, they were so used to being depressed that well just might mean they're getting along okay in life. They're just not down here. Now they're just sort of here. Some people were really doing pretty decently. They're just happy-go-lucky. As long as they're on their meds, they're doing fine. But then there are the side effects, which can be somewhat problematic. Mm. So that was a little bit of an issue. But you know what? As long as the scale tilted sort of in favor here, on the side of the good stuff, we could deal with some of the minor side effects. And that piece is really sort of OK. But word started getting out about a very interesting phenomenon. X number of people were not responding very well to these particular medications. And you know, I'm, I'm going to be legalistic here, and I'm not using any terms or any particular names, but as a class of drugs, the SSRIs were not doing well for some people. It actually made them worse. And for the longest time, we didn't know why. Until instead of getting pharmacologic, we got molecular biological. And we started to understand, once again, SSRIs basically allow you to retain more serotonin. But what if you're a person who's got lots of serotonin around, like an over-methylator? These individuals are the ones that are riding high with a baseline of lots of serotonin and lots of dopamine. Now you give them a drug or an agent 
that stops the destruction of serotonin and you're pushing them into overdrive. And folks, these are the people who have the tendency to become suicidal or homicidal after they've been given two to three weeks of an SSRI. That's why that becomes that kind of important. So now we know that actually with a simple test, checking for methylation, if we're gonna use pharmacological agents, we can determine which categories would be better for individuals. There was one fellow, and forgive me, I forgot his name, brilliant guy. He kind of saw a similar pattern without knowing the, the, the real molecular chemistry behind it. He said, you know what? My patient did so much worse when I gave them an SSRI. That SSRI gives more serotonin. What if I found a drug that actually stripped people of serotonin and gave it to my patients? He tried it on his population that weren't responding to the SSRIs, and guess what happened? They got better. And he said, this is awesome. But you know, here in the United States, we have a little bit of a problem with certain types of drugs, and so not available here anymore, but in Europe, you can go ahead and get that kind of medication, okay? But the idea here is from a molecular perspective, we understand that there, first of all, is a difference in certain types of chemistry that can lead to the same symptom of depression. They've got our under-methylated depressives, and they tend to be about 40%. We've got our over-methylated depressives, they tend to be about 20% of this particular pie. Now then, let's talk about pyroluria. Now that's a buzzword that everybody's using all over the internet these days. <laughs> or as a former president of ours used to say, the internets. Now we're seeing that, um, well, first of all, we're seeing that I don't have it up here on our so I'm just going to draw this molecule. Pretend with me that this house-like structure <coughs> represents a pyrrole molecule. Okay. This structure is part of the regular hemoglobin molecule that carries oxygen. Okay. And we find them in red blood cells. Now, every one of in 20 days, blah, 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 red, the whole thing breaks down and these molecules are spread out there and so what, why do we care? Well, these elements have an affinity for a group we call aldehydes in chemistry. And they seek to grab onto elements like zinc and vitamin B6, and they will deplete the system of zinc and vitamin B6 simply because they're there and they love them. Okay? They'll leave the body through the urine falling onto these two molecules. Now then, when that happens, hmm, what kind of domino effects do we see now? Well, glad we asked that question. Ah, clean paper. Boy, I was busy back in those days. There's something <laughs> up here all, all the time. Okay, anyway. Neurotransmitters like serotonin, like dopamine, like norepinephrine, and E for short, and our common neurotransmitters like gamma amino butyric acid. Each one of these neurotransmitters requires zinc and vitamin B6 in order for have processing. So if we're deficient, we get sort of a dysregulatory effect of our major neurotransmitters, okay? Now, and this does correlate with severity. The greater the severe loss of zinc and vitamin B6 in the system, the greater our neurotransmitter imbalance, the greater the cognitive effects. So since we're talking about depression today, I think everyone can guess right now that when pyroles are present in large enough numbers and are depletion of these elements is great enough, and our neurotransmitters are thrown off enough, people get depressed. Okay. So now what's the big deal here? Well, pyrroles are very interesting molecules because they're really a reference for what we call oxidative stress. Kind of like a sed rate and a C-reactive protein are for the scientists out there with regard to inflammation. It's both a marker 
and it is an element that we can monitor to give us a gauge as to how the chemistry is shifting as patients progress in one direction or another. But here's the real deal. What affects, or can anything affect, the levels of pyrroles in our system? And the answer is yes. Any form of stress, be it physical, be it emotional, psychological, or environmental. Physical, simple growth can cause a huge increase in the number of pyrroles that we have. And of course, that increases our oxidative stress, and that increases our depletion of zinc and B6, and that makes our lovely neurotransmitters go haywire in terms of balance. Now, growth. Well, we're all pretty well adult here, so what do we care about growth? Maybe not us, but our kids. We care tremendously about it. Who in the world has a two-year-old? Who in the world has a teenager? Who in the world remembers being a teenager? How sane were you seeming to your parents or even to yourselves back in those two time periods? We call them the terrible twos, and then we call them teenagers. Either way, we cringe just thinking about it. Okay. Well, teenagers and, and, and toddlers, they're both undergoing rapid changes in growth of both brain and body. Now, this domino effect that occurs with zinc and B6 certainly is happening not just in one area, not just in the mind, it's also happening in the body. The body multitasks that way. So what we see here is this depletion, just because of growth, sends our, our kids and our teens just a little bit on the offside. Mommy, I love you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> da, 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 da. Within minutes, within seconds, you tiptoe upstairs wondering, who is Jenna for the moment? Is she the child I gave birth to, or is she the child who wants to rip my head off? And you tiptoe around life like that. I just expect the toddler to go a little bit crazy. One moment they're happy, and the next moment they're crying vehemently. Well, we know that there are certainly signs that occur around this. White spots on your fingernails may actually be a, a sign of pyroluria. We know that with pyroluria, symptom-wise, we sort of hinted, the idea is that you can see rapid shifts in mood states, from calm to anxious to depressed to rageful. I call it the Incredible Hulk Syndrome. You can be Bruce Banner nice and calm one moment, and the Hulk within another moment, all because of stressors. Now, anyone out there still does not understand what pyro disorder is like, imagine you're driving down the street and someone cuts you off, and what's your first thought? I'm going to kill them. When you're driving down the street and you're trying to catch up and you're trying to do whatever, and digits get digitalized and things like that, and you don't want to do that because people shoot each other now, but all these things may happen, and I call it going pyro, okay? But it's not just growth. Conditions like illness, colds, flus, cancers, um, diabetes, hypertension, all these stressors on the body can also create an increase in pyrroles. So if you just take that analogy here and multiply it a billion fold, what kind of stressors aren't present? Gosh, you don't want to go to work today. You're really stressed out about your job. It's been a cumulative long process. You know what? You become pyroluric. Now to tie this in a little bit, we've known for a long time, oh gosh, somebody's been sick all the time. They must be stressed. You've heard that. But then you didn't really kind of know why and what the connector was. Well, zinc is a huge, huge key element in terms of immune function. Even now, you can see it all over the place in Zycam, lots of other products. In fact, I, I thought this was hilarious. I was reading a magazine called Men's Fitness, and every now and then it's browsing the, on the, air, the expressway, uh, expressway, the airlines in the airport. And I was reading an article, and it said, well, it's pretty commonly known. It's, the question was, which one of these are myths and which one of these are true? Well, vitamin C helps colds. And we're like, eh, we're not too sure. Um, zinc, uh, 75 milligrams. 75 milligrams. You know, in the old days, we would say, oh, that's toxic. But they said 75 milligrams of zinc taken on the first day will help a cold in terms of decreasing its length and its severity. And they marked that as true. And I thought this is really interesting that a lay person's magazine would say something like that because they get their information from, of course, scientific research and, and so forth. And I just kind of chuckled and said, well, we knew that a long time ago. But we're glad you're telling the rest of the world this now. So zinc is a very important immune modulator. And when pyro disorder hits it, we can see people with illness getting worse or the capacity to fight infection being severely hampered. Okay? 
Vitamin B6, very important in making serotonin and dopamine and so forth. Now, key signs and symptoms of pyrrole disorder. Sensitivities to light, odor, sound, or even textures. I call it the lost syndrome. Light, odor, sound, texture. You don't have to have all of them, but usually individuals who have pyroluria show one of these at least, and sometimes multiples, okay? Um, anxiety, depression, rapid mood swings. Here's one of the big significances. So many people have been misdiagnosed as being rapid cycling bipolar individuals when really they're pyroluric. When we get into treatment, so many of us just sit down and our hearts cry because the treatment is so simple, so simple, after getting the appropriate test to find out if you've got pyroluria or not. And then all those drugs that didn't work, may have worked for a little bit of time, and had side effects, you find out really weren't necessary. Now, I do want to state that I'm not saying drugs are bad. Not in the least bit. Some individuals need to be on medication for now, okay, until we get smarter and then we find out we're dumber and we're right the first time. But for many individuals, it's not necessary. It's cost, it's side effects, and so forth. So finding the right balance and finding the right key is very important. That's all I'm going to say about pyroluria. But the next piece of the pie, you can find it here. Which references, you can't really see it too well because my handwriting, but high copper. Okay. Copper is a very, very interesting metal. And you say, well, sure, we use it for making pottery and stuff and cooking pans and electrical wiring. Oh, electrical wiring. Fascinating. What else do we know that's electrical? Oh, I don't know, the human body, the human brain? Yes, could copper possibly have an effect there? And indeed, it does. Copper, see you here, is a very important element because one of the things copper does is that it takes dopamine and it pushes the conversion to norepinephrine, the neurotransmitter. Okay? What's norepinephrine about? Well, who hasn't heard of fight or flight? Who hasn't heard of your get up and go that needs to keep going, otherwise it's got up and went? Okay? We're talking about a key neurotransmitter for survival instincts. Okay? But here's the question. What if your norepinephrine continues to stay on instead of stopping when the emergency is over? Now your beta-1 receptors in your heart are going, you get this heart thing, palpitations going on, and it just won't stop, or that internal sense of anxiety is continuing, and after all that time that's going and going and going, all of a sudden you start to get really tired of it and kind of wear down and be really kind of depressed now. Okay. But got maybe too much copper on board and this conversion still keeps going on, it keeps going on, it keeps going on. Copper is involved with circuitry. We know it's a great conductor of electricity and that's why we use it in all sorts of products from our cell phones to lamps to lights to all sorts of things. But what is it doing to our nervous system? Here we're talking about a neurotransmitter. We're talking about copper and its effect converting dopamine to norepinephrine. But what about the nerve itself? Okay. Dawn, I'm glad you asked that question. Okay. Oh, that's one step beyond where I want to go to this point. Uh, I'll well, use this paper. Right yes, we really want to talk about epigenetics and we'll get there. But for now, I want you to forget all this page and look just down here underneath. I'm going to draw for you a very high-tech picture of a nerve cell, okay? This is where our lovely neurotransmitters come out, our serotonin, our dopamine, our norepinephrine. But this is the nerve cell itself. Now, what copper does is that it will directly stimulate that nerve. Well, Dr. Manson, how do you know all this sort of stuff? You're telling me about copper and its effects on nerve cells. Where's your proof? Well, let me tell you something, sunny boy or sunny girl out there. Back in 1942, a study was done where they took a nerve cell, put it in a Petri dish, and put just five micrograms of copper in that nerve cell. Guess what happened? Exactly. 
that nerve cell lit up like no one's business with activity. So we saw the underlying fundamental basis for the direct neural stimulation of nerve cells by the copper. Now remember, we're really ionic beings. We sit here in our skin and our hair, for those of us who got some, and we kind of are content in the package overall. But what we don't realize is what's going on underneath the several layers of skin, muscle, bone, on a microscopic level. We've got charges of ions moving in one direction or another, stimulating other processes to happen. You've got this great big cascade of stuff going on, all producing what is you, the human being, with human thinking, with emotions and feelings. Well, copper is one of those ions. Now, while we talk about it in sort of the more detrimental areas, copper is very essential and very important in many systems. The trouble is what happens when we have too much copper. That's when we develop issues. But back to our pie. Because of that constant nervous or neural stimulation, because of the effects with norepinephrine, copper is there and has been seen statistically as being the major cause of what we consider to be or call depression in about 15 to 20 percent of the population of those studies. Okay? Then we get to toxic metals like cadmium, arsenic, and lead. And then there's the others, and the other things I tend to refer to as stuff that affects the gut. Our diet, bowel syndromes, um, a myriad of disorders, inflammatory bowel conditions. And Dr. Bowman, my partner, and I were just talking about this interesting discussion about gut-mind psychology. And what's really happening, many of us have heard, well, you know, uh, the secondary source of serotonin in the human body sits in the gut. That's why you got to have that gut feeling about something. Or when Susie Lou breaks up with you and you're, you feel that pain, then you double over. And then, why aren't you doubling over up here? It's your heart is up here, but you feel it down here. And what we realize is, oh, wait a minute, there's something neurochemical going on here in the 30 feet or so, and some of us probably have a little bit more, uh, of bowel. And there's a molecular process happening there as well. So we have to consider anything that's going to affect this 30 plus feet and its capacity to behave or act or function is probably going to have an effect cognitively as well. And this is where we see the other, the bowel issues, the inflammation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is all this so important? We've talked about undermethylation, and remember, these are individuals with low serotonin and low dopamine. We've talked about the overmethylators, individuals who have a corresponding imbalance to having high levels of serotonin and high levels of dopamine. Then the pyroluric individuals who are losing zinc and vitamin B6. The high copper individuals who, by the way, I didn't kind of mention this, but it's not just depression that copper will tend to be a key uh, influencer of. Postpartum depression is also included in that category. Chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, fibroids, tumors, a variety of things can be seen as having some degree of relationship to having high levels of copper. Quick aside, because I, I can't resist this, I gotta talk about it. Copper is necessary for making blood vessels. Let's start there. Another thing that copper does, okay? When do you need blood vessels? Well, when you're making a baby. Not in the process of putting the seed in there, but in the process of growing the baby. Because you need blood vessels to grow, right? When else do you have blood vessels? Well, you know, you've got blood vessels with fibroid tumors. You have blood vessels with cancer. Most people don't think about it. But you cannot grow a cancer unless you've got blood vessels associated. I tend to watch some very interesting programs on TV sometimes. And the guy with the 100 pound tumor was really of interest to me. Did anyone see that one? Yeah, it grossed me out because I didn't think about this. I was like, why don't you just lop the thing off? You know, this guy's been growing this thing forever. And then they said something very interesting, which is supposed to be commonplace in the minds of a physician. When you cut the tumor, you see thousands of blood vessels, big, large blood vessels. That's how the tumor feeds. It sucks the life force out of you in order for it to grow. 
Copper is necessary for that to happen. When a woman is pregnant, her estrogen levels rise. This we know. What many people don't know or realize is that the estrogen rises in order to cause an increase in copper so that the blood vessels may grow and the infant may develop, excuse me, the fetus may develop accordingly. So there are physical, physiological, and psychological ramifications for copper. Good parts, bad parts, but too much can be a problem. Okay? So I want to put that out there for you. Are questions allowed at this point? Uh, no. I'm just kidding. Yes. <laughs> Um, how much of that 5% is the copper? Is it 15? This is 15, sorry. 15, yeah, 15 to 20%. Okay, it has to do with oral contraceptive use. Oh, 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 wonderful, wonderful, wonderful question. Oral contraceptives, we're going to kind of get into those factors later, but we'll talk about it now. Oral contraceptives, in particular, the estrogen progesterone combinations, it's the estrogen that is the main troublemaker. We see this a lot in individuals who are sexually active and simply don't want to be pregnant. And then with hormone replacement therapies, okay, later on in life. So the points in time where these kind of changes are, are happening and, and people want to either prevent or kind of reinstate normalcy, um, we end up seeing a rise in at least 30% of the population of depressives. I've seen this myself where individuals who you know, were happy-go-lucky people started on oral contraceptives and became depressed and they ended up breaking with their boyfriend, which is the real reason they started this in the first place, okay? Because he's like, what's wrong with you? They became depressed because the estrogen levels rose, the copper levels rose, and they became cognitively toxic, okay? To the point of having depression or anxiety or a combination of the two. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's one of the difficulties we have with many of the patients that we talk about with younger individuals. The question for them is, gosh, birth control, oral contraceptives, what do we do? I'm depressed, but I also don't want to have a baby. Or the opposite side, well, you know, I'm kind of done with all that, but there's some problems I like my hormone replacement therapy because it normalizes me. But at the same time, copper, as we test it sequentially, is increasing. And we know these individuals are having heading for a crash. <coughs> and we have to have very serious conversations about that because we know what's going to happen in the longer term. Now, it's not every female, it's the estrogen dominant female, the estrogen sensitive female. The same females, by the way, who tend to have an increase in breast cancers. Even the American Medical Association is saying now, we used to think estrogen and hormone replacement was a good idea, but now for these subsets of women, which again is once again about 30%, who are developing the breast cancers, a lot of them are sensitive to that estrogen. If you do that hormone replacement thing, these women are showing up with more breast cancer. That's one variable that comes into play. Now, there is a huge following out there for hormone replacement that has to do with bioidentical hormones. And I've got to share with you folks, it doesn't matter whether it's bioidentical or whether it's uh, made from the typical pharmaceutical industry or whether you get it from the dirt, okay? If it has to do with estrogen or being estrogen-like, it's going to have the same effect, ultimately, at the receptor site which is where the problem lies. So getting individuals to understand this is a real hard thing for some people, okay, because they love their bioidentical hormones, but they're called bioidentical for a reason. They have the same effect. So be very careful. If you're having any issues, any challenges in that direction, talk to your healthcare provider and try to find a, a, a pretty decent balance that way. Can we answer your question? Yes. Okay. So here we have Let's just review. I want you to forget the idea of depression as a disorder. It's more of a dysfunction. The question is, what's causing the dysfunction? Lots of things. I want you to forget the idea that it's a one size, one model. You say, I've got depression. We're supposed to know what that means. Do you have melancholia? Do you have dysthymia? Do you have bipolar disorder? Do you have cyclothymia? Do you have seasonal affective disorder? We live in Chicago, rest of the universe. Come on, six months out of the year. Who should be happy if that were the case, that we always had seasonal affective disorder? We've got like three months of life, and we live it to the fullest in the Windy City. And everyone goes manic. I mean, everyone gets very happy. Okay. So when you talk about this, depression is a very large word with large ramifications. But we really need to understand 
who are we as individuals? What is our real biotype and what does that do for us? All this to say these next few points here. Each one of these areas is treatable. And we can make inroads, and I'm not going to say cures, we can make very strong inroads to correcting a lot of these chemistries that are aberrant and improving the lives or conditions of many of these individuals who are considered to be depressed to begin with. Now, as I said before, some individuals will need a combination of medications, but they'll also need nutrient supplementation in order to increase their benefit. There are some individuals, depending on the chemistry, who don't need pharmaceutical agents at all. As a matter of fact, some individuals have been placed on as little as, and I don't want people out there running out and getting this stuff, as little as zinc and vitamin B6. They threw away their medication. Much to my chagrin, I had a patient like that out in a small town just west of Chicago, and I started this young lady on just zinc and B6 because you know what, there's some poor folks out there. They can't afford a lot of the the whole great, you know, conglomeration of take this and this and this and put it all together. I said, okay, let's just start you here with this process and we'll build from there. So, started her on just zinc and vitamin B6. She had depression. In fact, she had bipolar disorder. Okay? I didn't see her again. She never came back. I got a phone call. I said, where have you been? She said, Dr. Mensa, after I started that zinc and B6, I just felt something come over me. My medication just seemed too strong. I threw it away. I said, you weren't supposed to do that. First of all, I told you, don't get off your medication yet. <laughs> and then I said, let's talk sequentially. She said, Dr. Mintz, you don't understand. It, it just seemed too strong for me. And I said, oh, maybe you are one of those individuals who was not only zinc depleted, but you may have been a zinc depleted, hmm, maybe under methylator. And as we corrected your zinc levels, your serotonin started to rise. But your medication was an SSRI to begin with, so too much serotonin was coming in, and you had to, you had to toss one. And you decided to keep the zinc and the B6 because the cheaper. <laughs> but no side effects. And paraphrasing, she pretty much said that's correct. I said, So am I going to see you again as a patient? Okay. And she said, well, I'll check in with you. Never saw her again. But I know she's still taking her zinc and B6. Now, that was a quick and easy fix. And believe me, most cases are not like that. Yeah, that wasn't even the intention to fix. It was just, let's get you started. But depending on your chemistry, people can have reactions like that. Now, let's talk about, for example, the pyroluric patient. What did we say was the deal with pyroluria? Zinc and B6 deficiency, right? She may have been a pyroluric person, by the way. So, correcting these imbalances here, individuals typically get better in a very short period of time. Short being anywhere between a few weeks to literally two to three months. That's why it's so important just to even check if you've got pyloria and you are supposedly labeled as someone who's depressed. Because this is so simply correctable, it's not even funny if that is the primary cause of your condition. Now, we've talked about all these pieces of a pie, but we have to realize something. There is an inter pie. The entire human condition may have different elements of these things present. And each one gets dealt with, but you kind of do it together. In order to do this, you really need to have a firm understanding <coughs> of the ramifications of each nutrient, the biochemical pathways, the physiological pathways. In other words, don't try this stuff yourself at home. You do one thing and you're going to cause a whole lot of trouble somewhere else. One of the classic things, I was just talking to a patient this past week by telephone, and their, um, their sibling was a um, schizophrenic, okay, who also had depression, okay? labels, labels, labels. And their mother, I didn't have a whole lot of money, but mother was an avid reader. So she'd been reading Dr. Abram Hoffer's awesome work on natural healing for schizophrenia, and said, niacinamide. Oh, that's my boy. Well, that's the stuff to give this kid. So she had given him lots and lots of nice cinnamide. And I said, hmm. I said, you know, Hoffer was a brilliant guy. But like any brilliant man, any person, we don't all have the answers. Not all the answers, anyway. 
and I said, did we really check the methylation status on this kid? He said, oh, yes, we just did. As a matter of fact, you got the report in your hand. So Dr. Mentz is reading the report. I said, oh, hmm, you know what? Your sibling is an under-methylated individual who also has ooh, high copper. I'm going to explain to you the ramifications of just those two statements relative to aberrant nutrient use and utility. Undermethylators are low in serotonin. We talked very early in the discussion about transport molecules okay, as one of the things that could be affected by these chemistries. We have transport molecules for serotonin. They're the ones who will actually, um, where's that nerve? They'll actually bring the serotonin in here so that it can be popped out at the end of the nerve cell. Okay? Those are transport molecules. Now, you know, in our systems, where there's a molecule, there's either an activator, an inactivator, or a transporter. In other words, a mover. A mover and a shaker. Okay? Our serotonin transport molecules, we'll call them SERT. S E. R T are the guys that can either increase or decrease serotonin. In other words, cause the uptake back here. When we have individuals who take niacinamide, guess what niacinamide does to these transport molecules? It affects them in perhaps the wrong way. Because what it does is it speeds the production of these transport molecules. So it revs up transport molecules so that it takes the serotonin outside of activity and puts it back in the nerve. Let's go back to review. Somebody who's undermethylated or has few of these methyls, they're low in serotonin to begin with. These are the guys where usually the SSRIs work pretty well because they cause more serotonin to be kept out in what we call the synapse, the space where it helps communication between nerves. Now all of a sudden we're giving niacinamide, which is natural, the natural element, should be okay. But what Abram Hoffer didn't know was that niacinamide increases the activity of these transport molecules that takes what is already low for some people and makes it even lower. So are you helping this individual who is now by testing an undermethylator by giving them niacinamide. No. You know what happened, and this is my guesstimation as to what happened back in those days when the great Hoffer was doing his work. Dr. Hoffer probably had an interesting subset of patients who were overmethylators in schizophrenia. So when he gave the overmethylators, people with too much serotonin, niacinamide, and niacinamide caused those transport molecules to be increased in production, those little transport molecules got all that serotonin out of there. So that overstimulation went away, and it calmed the minds of these schizophrenics, and they improved. So now he had this great database. In those cases, he was right, but in other cases, he wasn't correct. Now, all this sounds great in theory, but you know we've seen it in practice for over 50 years. Okay, not that I'm old enough to have been in practice for 50 years, I have to say, but you know all of our clinical folks have been doing this. So the research, the theories have all really been supported uh, in terms of the studies and the empirical evidence that we've seen. Because I'm a real big skeptic. Anybody who's ever heard me speak has heard me say this. You know, I don't care what people are telling me. How my patients respond is the key. If they're not responding here, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to give them that, okay? But if they're responding, I've got to ask two questions. First, I say, great, and the question is, why? Is it all making sense? And from everything we've seen, these models regarding the biotypes are absolutely very strong in terms of what we see empirically with our patients, not just in terms of the theory. But People who are sitting there reading these books, and uh, I, I applaud people for looking for help. I really do. That's how we often you know, get to a lot of our people coming here. But you have to be careful about taking these things on yourself. There are huge ramifications for everything you do. 
I even, and, and forgive me, every doctor knows a little bit something different than every other doctor. Always a little bit something. But one of my patients that I hadn't seen in a very long time sent me an email the other day. Said, Dr. Mensa, uh, just calling this, you know, say hello and by golly, uh, kind of went off your protocol for a minute here and uh, saw someone else. Said, oh no, saw someone else. Um, and this doctor was just so sure that I needed um, copper to balance my zinc. So she gave me as much copper as I was receiving zinc. Now the zinc was coming from our protocol, so my first thought was if I had any hair, I'd be pulling it out right now, okay? Because that's a whole lot of copper. And I already told you how much copper it takes to stimulate one nerve cell. If you're talking about 70 milligrams, not micrograms, milligrams, I'm surprised this lady didn't jump off a roof. As a matter of fact, I said in my email, our good Dr. Walsh and Dr. Carl Pfeiffer would fall into comas hearing that you were given that much. But this is where we sort of have partial understanding of some elements, and, and I don't blame that particular practitioner because, like I said, the understanding in many circles is that you have to balance copper with zinc. Maybe in normal folks you can do that, when I say normal, I mean people who don't have cognitive or physical conditions. But for people who have cognitive or physical conditions, we don't give anyone copper. You get enough of that from your diet, get enough of that from your environment, on average. But remember, I don't want to get a whole bunch of emails about this either. We're talking about people with cognitive conditions. Depression for today, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, the whole kid and caboodle. We're not talking about Joe Blow, who's just kind of averagely going about his life and having a fun day with no ramifications whatsoever. My point was, be careful of nutrients. There's tremendous power in them. If you haven't gotten Dr. William Walsh's book, Nutrient Power, I don't get any kickbacks on this. This is just brilliant writing. If you want an education and understanding of the capacity of nutrients to benefit or even cause harm, this is a good book to have. Get it on probably Kindle or whatever it is, people who are technically involved and I'm not do these days. Yeah. Now, let's talk about some other entities. Oh yes, people who tend to be overmethylated. Now, these are folks, by the way, who are, I'm gonna bring up this word and many people have heard me talk about it. Folate, or folic acid, deficient people, okay? Don't have a whole lot of it going on here. Now remember the percentages. We're talking about really 20, maybe 25 percent of the statistical population. For a minute, I want to go back to undermethylators. Undermethylators and overmethylators. Remember, we kind of said they're almost diametrically opposed with regard to their serotonin and so forth and dopamine. Well, now the real question is, if we know that overmethylators are deficient in folic acid. What's happening with the majority of the population who are undermethylators? These are individuals for whom folic acid is extremely, extremely detrimental. Remember the low serotonin? Remember we just talked about with regard to, to niacinamide and its effects on the transport molecule? Folic acid does the same thing. So, individuals who are undermethylators taking a multivitamin. What's in a multivitamin on average? at least 200 to 400 micrograms of folic acid. Okay. Pantothenic acid, another B vitamin, okay? Also not good for the undermethylated person, the undermethylated person. We see the same thing happening. So, in general, I want to talk about the fact that a multivitamin may not be such a great deal for people who've got biochemical imbalances that lead to cognitive disorders. That's if you haven't tested their chemistry. So if you haven't tested your chemistry and you're feeling kind of down in the dumps, don't go just popping a B vitamin or a B complex. Very, very popular item, B complexes. What do they have? Oh, about a B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, B6, B7, B8, B30, okay? But part of that group involves folic acid, panathenic acid, and stuff that is probably going to be diametrically opposed to your statistical chemistry. Because most of the time we see more undermethylators than overmethylators. But on the other hand, if you have to be an overmethylator who's depressed, guess what you need? Folic acid. Chow down. Have a good time.
but don't overdo it. Okay? You can slingshot in the opposite direction. Remember, too many methyl groups cause overstimulation, overprocessing at the point it's almost like what we call tetany. Then all of a sudden you freeze, you can't do anymore, and you become depressed. Okay? Folates will remove the methyl. So it'll help bring you down from overmethylation to normal methylation. Okay? So that's not a bad thing, but if you slingshot too far in the other direction, that can be a problem too. Okay? So overmethylation, undermethylation, oh I gotta talk about diet now. One of the things I've not been really addressing a lot, but just started recently getting into. And just for summary purposes, you know some of the interesting characteristics of these things? Our perfectionistic people are get up and go. Mm, I call them the D's, the PhDs, the MDs, the JDs, the electrical engineers, the people getting their doctorates in, in different uh, fields, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, our nursing staff. Many of these professionals tend to be undermethylators because perfectionism is an underlying key characteristic that we see in undermethylation. These folks dot their I's, cross their T's, and it starts from when they're an embryo. In the womb, they're probably sitting out taking notes about exactly how they're going to be birthed and in which channel, which direction they're going to come out. Okay? They get out there, they take their steps, they learn everything, everything is perfect. You know, they're thinking already, planning their lives in kindergarten and already going to Harvard. Okay? These individuals tend to do very well once again. But here's the deal. Under methylation, now when they start to feel kind of funny, their first thought is, I need to cleanse my system. I need to perfect my diet. And you know what? Numerous studies have shown that if I just eat plants and leave meats alone, I'm going to feel great. And so we embark on certain types of diets that are more plant-based than anything else. Okay. Now remember, we're not talking about normal folks, regular folks who are just balanced. We're talking about people with cognitive disorders. And what happens? Ooh, where do we find folates in high concentrations? Leafy green. Leafy green vegetables. Dark leafy green vegetables. Soy proteins. Anyone ever seen a vegetarian diet that didn't include soy? Or a vegan diet that didn't include soy? I decided to Google all this one day. Uh, yes, I actually got my computer and learned how to use that thing after so many years and I found, oh my gosh, soy, satay, lutein, da 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 All these things were rich in folic acid. But many of the people who were embarking on these journeys were under methylators. And very interestingly, when I talk to some patients by telephone, I say, you know, you probably shouldn't engage in a vegetarian diet. I say, Dr. Mansa, let me tell you, I know that one about Two years ago, I tried cleansing myself, and I want, went pure vegetarian, and I just felt horrible. I will not do that again. I said, well, I wasn't chastising you. I was just kind of bringing it up. They're saying, been there, done that, tried it, and for me, that was the case. It didn't work. Reason, biochemically, was really because there was too much folate removing what little methyl they had. They couldn't activate the neurotransmitters or enzymes or their hormones and the depression issues got worse. On the other side, if you happen to be an overmethylator, please graze as much as you want, okay? Enjoy the journey. It'll more likely be good for you, okay? So the question isn't good diet, bad diet. The question is, who are you and how? what does your chemistry require? That should be the guide, okay? Now I've met some people who are, of course, philosophically opposed to eating meat, and I've heard some people say, you know what, I'm philosophically opposed to it. But let me tell you, if it's going to make me better, I'm going to eat it, okay, as part of a balanced approach. Now, of course, we know preparation is key, too. We're not saying go out and get yourself a slab of barbecue and, you know, char that thing on a grill with all the flame and the charcoal getting in there. Food preparation, processed foods can be problematic. So we're talking about appropriate preparations, appropriate approaches to healthy eating, whether it's meat or plant-based. Okay. While we're talking about diet, foods rich in copper. If you find you test yourself copper toxic, don't think that you're going to be engaging in a lot of those wonderful foods that you love so much, like chocolate. 
Does anybody here hate chocolate? I have yet to see anyone protesting a chocolate factory. Have you ever seen that happening? <laughs> no one's outside picketing chocolate? No. Chocolate is a great producer of serotonin. It's also a little bit too rich in copper. So you have to be careful about that. But that's why we feel good eating it. Sit there, <laughs> cold night in Chicago, watching a movie on Friday night, and just sitting there with your chocolate. Just enjoying it. That serotonin fills you up. You feel good. And it doesn't matter that your day was filled with horrendous things. It's you and HGTV or whatever it is you like to watch, Psychopathic Today, or whatever it is, <laughs> you enjoy it. Okay? Cabo. What about avocados? Avocados can be, well, what I always say, by the way, is there's a caveat. We're not saying it's an all or none phenomenon. We're saying don't overdo, don't over engage. Yes, avocados are rich in that, so you have to be careful. But it's the big picture, folks. You know, if you know that your day is you're going to have three meals and a few snacks during the course of the day, you know, if you're going to have a little bit of folic acid in your underlap later, you know, just balance out the rest of your meals. We're just saying don't overdo it. Don't get huge amounts that are going to cause you trouble. We're not saying totally abstain from the food, unless you're severely toxic. That's all of the story. Okay? So, toxic elements. Now, that's a real tough one because when we're talking about toxic metals like cadmium, arsenic, and lead, you know, and mercury as well, there are environmental considerations. One of the things, that, especially guys, guys come in. They come to the office and, well, you know, Dr. Benson, I just got to tell you, I'm feeling a little bit depressed these days. Uh, I have no real reason to be depressed. You know, I got a great job, wife, family, kids, all things doing well, and I don't know what it is. And I'm from Pittsburgh, and uh, I go, really? Pittsburgh, you say? Okay. Are you around a lot of environmental toxicities? Mm. And I hear, uh, well, no, not really, but... Uh, I said, what, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a welder. I go, ah. How long have you been welding with the toxic metals? And they say, oh, 15 years. I said, ah. You can inhale those fumes from those metals. It gets in your system. Welders are notorious for issues regarding depression or mood instability. I would say mood instability. Um, depression, anxiety, things along those lines. But they're also very high in many of these toxic elements like cadmium. Okay. Now our testing tends to be one that's a little bit more difficult for elements like arsenic because arsenic kind of moves in and out so fast it's really hard to determine and good reference ranges for those metals are hard to determine once again in all of our urinary challenge testing but we do them in order to get an idea but history is what really gives us the clue in many cases about some of these toxic levels for us to do additional testing, okay? But these things can certainly uh, play a real trick on your brain and can promote depression. So people who live in old houses, oh, that's a big one. Everyone thinks about lead. Why? Because you got the old lead-based paint thing in the ceiling, and I, I almost just lost it when one patient told me, well, you know, I remember before this happened, I was redoing my house. It's an old Victorian. I said, oh, 18 ago, oh my gosh. I said, did you at least wear a mask? Well, no, cool people don't wear masks when they <laughs> do these housing things. You know, okay, so a lot of people do, a lot of people don't. But, you know, the chips and the paint and the fumes and this, and I just didn't feel with it too well after that. Here's the problem with things like lead. It gets in the bones, and it takes a long time to come out, and it will leach over and over again. And when lead comes out, it certainly messes with your brain function, and depression is very common with that. Okay. But the other deal that I have a problem with in terms of old houses is copper, copper pipes. So now when you're drinking water, you're showering water, copper, the stuff leaches out, and we've already talked extensively about what happens to copper and what copper does in your system. Okay. So metals like copper, problem, but easily testable. Okay. Treatment? gradual. You do not want to do stuff on your own because if that stuff comes out too quickly, namely copper, it reactivates. We talk about metals as though they're one big homogenous family. They're not. Each metal has its own personalities different than everyone here in this room. For example, 
mercury even, within your body, reacts differently at different points in time and in different places. In your body, mercury has a half-life of about 40 days. In your brain, mercury has a half-life of 72 days. Okay? So when you're talking about exposure, and then you're talking about time, and you're thinking, well, it's still in my system or it's not, and you don't recognize some of these things, you can't really determine that you're toxic. What's in your tissues is not the same as what's in the serum or in the urine or what's affecting everything. But copper is a nasty, nasty creature because it may be in your tissues, but as soon as it leaves your tissues and enters the bloodstream, it reactivates and it'll affect every single receptor site that you've got that's responsive to copper. So people who are depressed, they get more depressed, they get more anxious, they get more irritable. Boom. We once had a young lady, I talk about this case because it was, to me it's almost funny, but it wasn't funny for them, family members, got a phone call once again from a similar small town, a phone call from the family members of somebody we had started a copper detoxification process. We were getting the copper out of this person who had been actually classified as being bipolar. Okay, they were copper toxic. And I gave the order for one... 100 micrograms, I'm not going to tell you of what, but that equated to one drop of this element to be taken on the tongue per day. I said, if you do more than this, there are going to be problems. So, two weeks later, I got a phone call from Mr. So-and-so, who happens to be the husband of this lady, and he said, Dr. Mensa. I said, Yes. <laughs> said, what did you do to my wife? No one in my family is happy around this lady. She's angry. She's agitated. She's worse than she usually is. She's making all of our lives miserable. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And I'm thinking, boy, what did you do this time? We are in trouble. And I checked the labs, checked the protocol. and said, tell me what you're doing. He said, well, we're doing exactly like you said. We're giving her this particular element, and she's taking it religiously. And something said to me, ask how much? <laughs> so I said, well, how much is she taking? Exactly what you said. Eight drops per day. Oh. And I went, holy what? I said, did you read the instructions I gave you? One drop per day. I said, Mr. So-and-so, let me tell you something. I prescribe these things very specifically for a specific reason. Now, we talk about the fact that too much copper comes out too rapidly. You're going to reactivate the entire system, and she's going to go bonkers. So now you see the proof. Goes, oh, 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 we're so sorry, Dr. Mensa. We apologize, Dr. Mensa. We'll take care of that, Dr. Mensa. I felt better personally. Okay. But the fact is that that was so powerful an element and so reactive an element that when it comes out in too much volume, all life goes to pot and everyone around that particular life. <laughs> and it tends to be transitional. That can be three weeks to a month. But the fact is that you have to be careful. There is real power to what you do in terms of nutrient supplementation. It is not to be played with lightly. Okay? Stuff can work too well in many different directions. Okay? Is that same copper? They cause fibromyalgia or be a component of it. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Menstrual irregularities, etc., etc., etc. So if you're miserable at that point in time, and many women are cyclically miserable for a few days, um, copper is part of that, and it can make that worse as well. Okay, so we have to be careful about what we're doing, what we're taking. Um, I want to give, of course, an honorable mention discussion about gut syndrome. I really have to thank uh, my partner, Dr. Bowman, because she's kind of converted me to more of a discussion and more of a thinking about this, because I say, oh, listen, you, you go ahead and put it with your gut issues. You know, adults don't really deal with leaky gut too much. It's for the kids, the autistics, blah, blah, blah. And she said, no, 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 I don't think so. It's that, it's not that way, and so forth, so forth, so forth. And I said, okay, fine. Well, you know what? As in the past couple of years, I've had to humble myself to her. <laughs> um, really big discussions evolving now around gut and imbalances and, and syndromes and leaky gut things and and inflammation. The key about inflammation here is that it affects the entire system, not just part of it. What may start in the gut will affect the brain. What may start in the brain will affect the gut. And many proteins that are dealing with the brain are also helping the gut. So our treatment protocols now involve 
assessing gut dysfunction, everything from yeast to dysbiotic organisms to bacterial overgrowth, and we're looking at addressing all these issues because gut and psychology syndrome, one of the popular uh, books and concepts out there is certainly now talking about serotonin as being primarily synthesized in the gut and you have dysbiosis, what happens, overgrowth of the wrong bacteria, the list goes on and on and on. So Dr. Mensa finally came to the understanding. Maybe with adults we better talk a little bit more about the gut. And I approached Dr. Bowman with all due humility on that one because as I always tell people, we went to med school together, so there was always one of those sibling rivalry kind of things going on, but um, she was absolutely correct in that. So one of the things that we talk to patients about now who come in with depression in a very tiered fashion, tier number two to tier number three, let's explore the entire gut phenomenon now with you. Okay? Let's look at not just what you're eating, but let's look at generalized testing to see, do you have dysbiosis? Are you taking pre or probiotics? What is your diet really looking like and how will you really stick to it? What kind of processed food challenges do you have? Okay. Now, I'm going to become all American for just one minute and tell on myself because I used to engage in the four basic American food groups. The French fry food group, the pizza food group, the Coca-Cola food group, and then of course the pie and cake food group. I had the four basic essentials. Now, I also didn't understand, I thought I was getting, forgive me, fat, okay, <laughs> over time. And that was me from many, many years ago, not me today. Um, and my joints were aching. I sound like a TV commercial. My joints were aching. Uh, I was miserable and da 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 da. The list goes on. But Dr. Mensah, you're a doctor. Well, you know, we were working too hard and so we just took the easy way out. And Dawn's laughing because she knew me back in those days. Um, but then I realized, I said, wait a minute, is it just that I'm overweight or maybe something to do with my diet? So when I started looking at processed foods, and you guys are saying, duh, we told you guys this a long time ago, and kind of shifted a few things, you know, it's very true, the inflammation aspect tended to resolve. Now this is not a discussion about me, so I'm going to stop this right now, but I'll say that in general, if there are a lot of conditions people are experiencing, both physically and cognitively, you might want to try stepping back away from an excess of these things. When we were growing up, McDonald's was a treat that you got maybe once a weekend, maybe once or twice a month. Now it's become a mainstay. And I have nothing against McDonald's. I think McDonald's French fries are the best in the universe. I'll rack them up against anybody's. I'm a French fry connoisseur. Okay? <laughs> the difficulty is that when we are consuming and really living off of processed foods, that can play a role not just in our physical condition, but also in our psychological or cognitive uh, conditioning. Okay. So let's summarize after all this verbosity. Depression. Forget about it. The question is not your mood. The question is what's causing it. Let's think about biotypes. Let's think about methylation disorders. Let's think about metal toxicities. Let's think about pyroluria. Let's talk about diet. Let's talk about toxic metals. Let's talk about the outer environment and the inner environment. And let's talk about how we can correct these variables, for the most part, without resorting to very mm, difficult and extraordinary means. Okay? Sometimes taking the right balance of supplements is difficult in and of itself. But at least we minimize the side effect potential without using certain types of agents that will pharmacologically uh, move us in one direction or another. But the first step is testing. Once we test to know where we stand, if we have to go pharmacological, we know which are the better, more likely choices to go. And that makes a lot more sense to me than the guesswork we've been doing in traditional medicine for the longest time. Well, does it sound familiar? Well, we'll try you on first... Uh, this one. And if that doesn't work, then we'll try you on that one. If that doesn't work, we'll add one from this class. And by the time you're done, you've got three, four, or five meds over here. Then you've got the meds you take to counteract the side effects from those other medications. And then if those don't work, you got to find one. Then insurance is going to cover that one. So now you've got to find one med to support that one. Then that one contradicts with that one. Then you've got kidney, liver, or other toxicities going on. And you just don't know what to do and you're broke. Let's not go that route. Let's try a slightly different approach. 
Let's try something that's a little bit more logical. Certainly is time tested, and it certainly goes along with the research that's been there. And the empiric data goes along with 50 years worth of research. Okay, I can tell you now. Other places around the world are going right in line with this, and they're getting great results. Okay, so outside of the United States, oh yeah, the United States we're kind of slow, but sooner or later we're going to come up forward. Okay, so that's the key thing I want you to remember. <laughs> Depression is not one disorder. It's many different disorders biochemically that produce similar symptoms, and sometimes very different symptoms. If we start asking the questions, who are you? In fact, I like that one. I'm going to create an entire paper here with nothing else on it, if I can find it. There we go. First, ask the question, who am I? Biochemically. Don't go up to your mother and say, who am I? <laughs> we'll be bringing you in to see one of us. Well, my son doesn't know who he is, and I've told him for 30 years who he was, and all of a sudden he's asking these questions. So he saw you on TV, so I'll fix him quickly. So that's going to be pretty much the end of the formal presentation. I want to open this to questions, because I know I've been talking for a long time. I don't know how long I've been talking. Anyway. Any questions at this point, please? Yes, sir. Uh, so testing for biotypes, um, is that there's some hesitancy um, for, let's say, someone that's entering treatment. We're not doing it, you say, in the United States? We don't know about it yet. Um, this is very much the forefront of medicine in terms of research. These new paradigms are something that, and I shouldn't say we don't know about it, we actually used to know about it a long time ago before the brilliant Dr. Lister talked about the role of bacteria. Then the entire medical field shifted to what is affecting us from the outside world and invading us, as opposed to the world of back in the days of alchemy, where they focused on what was going on internally and how to manipulate that. Okay. So we forgot all that stuff. And then we got scientific and brilliant and started with outer invasions, but we still didn't know what to do with psychiatry or with the brain or with mood disorders. Now we have a, a better feel, and we're starting to come around. So it's in the we're crawling starting. stages. It's in the crawling stages. Other countries, though, they're like, okay, we knew that. We've been doing that for years. What are you talking about? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? I'm just wondering, with anxiety, because do those people tend to have high problems because that mm. accelerates the development? I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. That kind of reopens our conversation. Um, High copper individuals, for example, anxiety falls in the same category, by the way, as copper. You can almost duplicate this board here. Um, zinc deficiencies, pyroluria, high copper, toxic metals, under and over methylation, each one of those can also produce symptoms of anxiety. Because of the, the, the most of our discussion is going to be about depression, that's kind of where I focused. But anxiety can be seen in each one of those conditions as well. And when you correct those imbalances, both anxiety and depression tend to improve. Okay. So that's why testing is so key because if somebody is simply pyroluric and nothing else is going on from and you've done all the tests you can think of and you treat the pyroluric, you expect the anxiety and depression to improve or go away. Methylation disorders take longer to work, but nonetheless they typically do. Anxiety is very interesting because one of the things I didn't mention, when we talk about phenotypes, so to speak, of methylation disorders. The overmethylated individual seems to be that calm, cool, collected person that's always around. Not much really phases them. You know, stuff just happens in there. You know, it, the room's on fire. You're like, okay, I'll leave. The undermethylator says, I smell smoke. Call in the fire department. They're gone. Over meth layers are going to take their time. Now, these are, remember, the high serotonin people. So not a lot phases them because they're already riding up here. For them to get a thrill out of life, they got to go way out there. These are the folks that are going to stand up on the roller coaster. They're going to, hmm, what do I do for fun? I'm going to put on a little suit, jump off of a cliff, wave my arms, and glide all the way down. Okay? These are true over meth layers. I don't need to swim. I like to swim with sharks. 
<laughs> without a tank, without anything else around to protect it. That's how I get my thrills. That's where I surf, off the coast of South Africa, where the great whites are, in murky waters that are dark and dingy, so no one can see me, including <laughs> me. But the sharks know where I am. Over methoiters. They need extremes to make themselves feel alive because they're operating high serotonin. They look calm on the outside, but internally they're very anxious people. So when anxiety is present in an over methoiter, it's powerful because there's a tremendous amount of inner tension. And these are the same folks, once again, let me remind you, who when they take SSRIs that add more serotonin to the system, that's like overload. And they'll oftentimes become very suicidal, or they'll become homicidal. Most of traditional medicine doesn't recognize this yet. They don't know this is the real reason behind that commercial, where you hear about some wonderful medication for depression, and you hear 15 seconds about all the good it does, and 45 seconds about all the bad stuff it does, and it ends with may cause homicidality or death. Basically, they commit suicide. Talk to your doctor first. Take drug X. It's great. Can I please have $85? That's the point. I think um, kind of what I was getting to, not only is it in the beginning stages and not recognized, but big pharmacy would be out of plus good against that, and they're going to lose money. Well, if they look at this correctly, they shouldn't be so much against it. And actually, some companies are already on board with it because they recognize that, you know what? If you've got the right nutrients on board to, say, elevate serotonin, and you're giving an SSRI, you can actually decrease the dosage of that serotonin drug, decrease the side effects, and your patients are more likely to be compliant okay. yeah. and continue as opposed to dropping your medication. You actually would make more money, okay? Unless they got totally cured, and that's another story. We won't talk about that. But the two can work hand in hand. That's what we're saying. Yeah. Um, we were talking about overmethylators. Did I answer your question about overmethylation? Oh, anxiety. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. The overmethylator can have tremendous internal anxiety but look calm on the outside. The undermethylator, you've seen them, but the members know this. When they've got anxiety, it's really, really bad. They just can't do anything. They can't function. But it's, it's terrible. And there's a whole other that happening. So I can't do this. I gotta talk. Da, 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 da. Ask a thousand questions. Personality types. I gotta go here. Okay. Undermethylators are the most controlling. Non-compliant people, on average. They're lovely, wonderful people, but, you know, I read this study the other day, and I think I'm just going to change that, and I don't particularly want that low music. I'm going to take that out in the afternoon, and then I'm going to ship this over here and over there, and da 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 and then you get a phone call. Um, you know, I don't quite feel right. I don't, I don't think what you're, what you're telling me to do is working. Well, what do you do? Are you taking the, the programs we've discussed? Well, yeah, except for three quarters of it that I rearranged, but you know, that really should make a difference to Yes, it does. Now, on the other hand, over methylators tend to be very, very compliant individuals. But many times they're just so despondent that it's just very hard for them to churn through this. Um, and then, you know, the pyrolytics, by the way, over methylators tend to be very creative people, if I didn't see that already. Very creative. They're the artists, philosophers, poets. They give color to our lives. And they give color to themselves. Instead of being the undermethylator who has get up and go like yesterday, the overmethylator sits and waits for their creative news. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to go to the cabin and sit till inspiration hits me. Day 20. I haven't shaven or taken a bath. I'm by myself, staring at my typewriter. Well, the oldest of typewriter, now our computers, laptops. Then I see a squirrel. <sighs> The squirrel came out of the woods, and it did this, and it did that, and all of a sudden my my 500-page masterpiece is done in five days. 25 days to get started, five days to complete it. The creative news. It takes a lot to get the over-methylator going. Okay. I'd love to talk to you about marriage and all sorts of stuff. Boy, that can be a very juicy topic, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Because uh, I can say, watch out, you lovely under-methylators getting together, and you over meth waiters getting together. <laughs> Lovely blends can be really good, but really there are a variety of factors that come to that in terms of mates. We've seen all the above kind of get together with some very interesting effects. But um, that's a subject for another discussion at another time. Uh, any other questions relative to this? 
done? All this verbosity, and you absorb this? Okay, quiz time. Everybody take out a piece of paper. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I'm going to hang around for a little bit if you want to ask any other questions or any other discussions. I want to thank our special, special guests, our mentors and friends, uh, Don and Emily. Thank you for making the trip. Well, they're just cute little buttons. So <laughs> these kids these days are so growing up so lovely. Uh, thank you, folks, for coming. Thank you. Oh, lithium. You guys can go, but I'll, I'll just stand up here and talk to you about lithium. This is what I'm doing. Lithium what I'm doing. works well because. It is a cellular membrane stabilizer. Now, can I bore you with one more story? I got to tell you the story of lithium and how we, we found out about this thing. There's a town in Texas, we mentioned the name of the town, but people started noticing that nobody there, almost nobody, was ever depressed. And so the usual group of scientists descended upon this town and they started studying soil, started studying food, water, everything, air. And what they found was a tremendous amount of lithium was present. And they said, this is very interesting. So they took it to the American Psychiatric Association. And the APA said, no, we don't think so. So they shared that information with the rest of the world. And guess what the rest of the world did with it? Very interesting. We're going to have to study this. So we started giving lithium to their patients. Their patients did really well. So now the World Congress of Psychiatrists got together, uh, and I forgot where it was, in Europe somewhere, and all these papers are represented about the greatness, the great effect of lithium on patients with bipolar disorder, depression, da 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 da. And the Americans were shocked. They're like, this is amazing. Did you hear about this? Did you? They asked, where did you guys find out about this? They said, Texas. So wait a minute. In the United States, they said, yes. Found out about it here went around the world before we finally got a clue about it. What was the lithium actually doing? Lithium is a membrane stabilizer. When we look at a cell, and we have the cell nucleus here, and we have the cell membrane, so to speak, that which protects the outside of the world from the inside of the cell. Now, let's take this cross section, this is flat, and rotate it this way. What we see is an actual what we call bilayer that has to have a certain consistency, a certain fluidity. It's kind of like the waves of a dance as you roll back and forth, which allows for ion channels for calcium and a variety of other elements to move from the outside of the cell, inside, inside, outside, etc., etc. When we take things like phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylserine, you guys are familiar with that, those particular nutrients, I imagine. They actually are branched elements that help to keep the stability of the membrane of the cell. That's what allows for functionality. What lithium does is that it comes in and it also is a membrane stabilizer. When you have low levels of lithium, the fluidity of this, what we call membrane bilayer, actually ceases to work quite so well, it becomes rigid becomes falling apart. So now all the electrical activity, all the ionic movement, really becomes extremely dysfunctional and dysregulated. Now we take that dysregulation, and we've just shown you a piece of this membrane, but it's happening all over here. The cell doesn't just act in the nucleus by itself. It requires movement from the outside of the cell, inward to the cell, of not just sodium and potassium, not just glucose, not just lithium, not just copper, a variety of elements have to move from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And water, of course. If this membrane is not fluid, all of these reactions do not work properly, which means that the nucleus ultimately is going to be deficient of what it needs to function as far as DNA and genetic expression is concerned. Do you get that? Good, because you're going to reproduce it now on your test. <laughs> so, so you're but, not seeing any interplay with the bios, right? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. What we're seeing is that lithium is consistent in terms of 
it's assisting everything else to work. If you are taking zinc, for example, one of the big elements we talk about, and you need zinc to function here, or you need methyl to cross this membrane, you have to have a fluid membrane. If it's not fluid, you're not going to get enough, and I don't mean liquid, I mean just mobile, you're not going to get enough methyl entering the nucleus of the cell and leaving and affecting DNA and everything else it's got to do. So this little thing we call the membrane is very key. If we do not have stability, <clears throat> the rest of everything goes to pot. That's why you see mood disorders, and that's why you see lithium helping mood disorders. Now let's talk about forms of lithium. We use a form called lithium orotate. What you're familiar with mostly is lithium carbonate, which is the drug. Now, you know, that stuff was working so well back in the old days for actually the stomach issues and, and gut issues. And then the psychiatrist realized this worked well for depression too. But lithium carbonate became the, the, the treatment of choice, which was a pharmaceutical agent. And it had side effects. You've got to monitor lithium levels. There's thyroid conditions. There's kidney issues. Lithium orotate operates at a fraction of the dose of lithium carbonate. It does not have those kind of toxicities. You don't have to do lithium levels, but you get an actual sub-therapeutic effect good enough to provide stability enough for everything else to function. And you know what? People tend to feel better on lithium orotate without having to go to the pharmaceutical agent lithium carbonate. So we use that as part of our programming. We can see through testing whether somebody is low in lithium. Okay. And then we will prescribe the right amount of lithium borotate, not lithium carbonate, to assist in dealing with all these other conditions. This is one cell. We got trillions of them. So you take this, multiply this by a trillion, and you have dysfunction big time. Okay. So that's the deal with lithium, period. 